Can you give me your name, title, and the name of the organization you're with? Mm, my name is Melissa Fields. I am the coordinator of the Anti-Drug Coalition here in Stewart County. Uh, official name is Stewart County Prevention Coalition. What made you passionate about coalition work? So I'm, I'm actually passionate about helping people. Um, I am a certified prevention specialist. So before I actually started in the coalition, uh, I worked for Centerstone and my position was in drug and alcohol uh, prevention. And from there, uh, I actually taught drug and alcohol prevention. We did bullying prevention, um, anger management, yeah, all of those other things. And then the grant that funded my position with Centerstone was taken away from Centerstone. So then I was out of prevention services for a little while. And this grant became available that funds my position. And it's actually the same monies that I worked for under Centerstone. But the state realized that coalition work is a little bit more effective in a full community than um, the programming that we were doing. So I got this position. It kept me in the same type of work that I was doing. And um, we've just gone from there. So we're here to talk about the $1 million grant that the coalition received for a living facility in Stewart County. Would you like to summarize a little bit about what that grant is for and the coalition's plans for that money? Uh, yeah, it's $1 million. We are using the money to purchase and refurbish the Sunset Motor Inn and it's going to be used for women who are in recovery to have a place to live uh, with their children. And why is it a women's only facility? Just doing, uh, really just doing a little bit of research um, on the state website at different facilities throughout the state. Um, the men to women ratio is about two to one. Um, we also have a, an employee that works with people that either need to go to treatment or need to find rehabilitation or need to find recovering houses like what we're getting ready to open and she has a hard time finding some for women. Uh, so when we wrote the grant we wanted to accommodate women but we also wanted to be able to accommodate women that had children. There are many there aren't many uh, facilities in the state just from just from the research that I did yesterday which was only one company that has several living facilities in our state there's only 12 that accommodate women with children and many of those don't allow children up to a certain they only allow them up to a certain age so let's say age five well if if i have a child what am i supposed to do with my child after you know when they turn six years old so we're not going to put an, a, an age limit on the children they'll be able to bring their children whatever the age limit is all right and what's what is the male to female ratio for help through programs like these uh, again, just in the, what I was looking at yesterday, um, there were 79 men's facilities and 41 women's facilities. So like I say, it's about two to one. And how does this differ from a halfway house or other rehabilitative living spaces? Uh, first of all, it's not rehab. Um, we're not a treatment center. We're not, we're not going to be a re rehabilitative center. This is actually permanent housing. Um, so a lot of these women may be coming from a rehab facility or, or a treatment facility uh, or um, somewhere like that, or they may be coming straight from, from jail, um, but it, it's not a rehab facility. And halfway houses are usually an after rehab or after treatment as well. The difference in us in a halfway house is that our women don't have to leave. A lot of times when you have a halfway house, they kind of go through a program and they get on their feet and then they have to find other living, living quarters we're not going to require that. This is going to be um, an opportunity for permanent living for the ladies that stay with us. All right, and um, there's been a lot of community outreach, so we were wondering what kind of donations are you needing? Uh, at this point, we don't have pos possession of the, of the motel yet, so we are still waiting on our contract from the state to be able to, to get the funding to purchase it. Uh, so we don't really need anything right now other than just maybe an outreach to say that people are wanting to help. Um, we are planning for each room that we have for these ladies. There's going to be 15 rooms uh, and out of those rooms we're, we're reaching out into the community to see if anybody would want to sponsor a room. So and in sponsorship <clears throat> that really is going to look like whatever the people that are sponsoring it want it to look like. 
Um, we, we're kind of looking for, at the minimum, uh, let's say a, a housewarming gift. Uh, linens, things like that. Um, but at this point, we don't really need that. We're just kind of looking for people that would want to do that for us once we get once we get started. And you know, to be honest with you, I've already had five people look, you know, reach out and say that they want to that they want to do it. Five organizations or individuals. Okay. And what kind of donations are you really, really not needing at this moment? Again, we, we don't we don't need anything right now, but we are um, we have an email list set up. We've got it set on our uh, our Facebook page, the coalition Facebook page. If you want to get any more information after this, uh, uh, what we might need and when we need it, um, just go to that. You can sign up to be on the email list, uh, and then we'll start putting that information out there as as it comes to us. You know what we're looking for and, and you know what we need. How will work on this property be decided on? Just like any organization, uh, whether it's county, whether it's a nonprofit organization, you know, there are policy and procedures in place, things that are in your bylaws. Um, we'll, we'll take bids on, on each project that needs to be done. Um, and there are, there are several large projects that need to be done. We'll, we'll need, you know, air conditioning systems. We'll need flooring, things like that. So we'll take bids on those. There are some things that we won't have to take bids on. For example, just like regular cleanup around the facility, um, painting, things like that. Um, but according to policy and procedures of the coalition that we have to take bids on anything over $5,000. Okay, so over $5,000 is gonna be bids. Yes. Okay. All right, and when are you going to be opening the facility? Uh, as, as soon as possible. We um, we have to wait on our contract from the state, and then from there, uh, there's some things that we have to do in order to get the funding. Uh, this is a re this is a reimbursement grant, so we have to have set up with a bank that um, you know that we can get the money, pay for the property, and then get reimbursed by the state. That's how all my grants are right now. Uh, we pay out the money and then we send an invoice to the state and they and they pay it back to us. So um, until we get that grant contract, we're not able to do a whole lot. And then even after we get that grant contract, there are some documents that we have to sign and send to the state before we can before we can purchase and before we can start renovating. Does the coalition receive any county funding? Uh, yeah, so we we first became a nonprofit just last year. We've had our nonprofit status since 2020, but before that, all my grants were being run through the county. So they were pretty much, I don't want to call them the bank, but that's pretty much how it was. It wasn't, we didn't use money out of the general fund. It was just a straight grant, just what we call it at the county commission, a, a run through. Um, but when we started our nonprofit and, and took all of our grants underneath our nonprofit status, um, like I said in the last question, we have to have money to spend in order to get reimbursed the money that we spend. And when we first started out, we didn't have very much money. I think that we had a, we had about seven hundred and fifty dollars in the bank, and our grants are over one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So we needed money to to be able to spend. And what we did um, was some fundraising. Uh, we did several fundraisers, and we did fairly well on them. But we also went in front of the nonprofit committee with the, with the county and we asked for $15,000. Since we were a new coalition, they only ag agreed to give us $7,500, which was okay. Um, is obviously better than nothing. Um, and then um, this year we went in front of the, we actually asked for the $7,500 that they didn't give us last year. And um, after I got to thinking a little bit more about it, we took our uh, request back from the nonprofit committee because there's opioid settlement money that's that's coming to our county and we're one of the organizations that can be awarded some of that money so instead of taking the money out of the general fund which is where the nonprofit money comes from it's out of the general fund of the county um, we ask for for our, our funding to come from the opioid settlement money because that money does not go into the general fund. You can't use it in the general fund. And um, there's only specific things that you can use it for. And prevention, treatment, and recovery is all that you can use it for. So we're one of the, we're one of the nonprofits that can actually benefit from the opioid settlement money. And then, like I say, it, it keeps $7,500 into the general fund and leaves that there. So, but yeah, we, we do get a little county funding. All right. 
And will this facility need any funds from the county in order for it to get started or sustain itself? Um, as far as asking for any money specifically for this project, we're, we're not asking for specific money for this project. We are getting the grant, it's, it's going to get it started, and then as far as sustaining itself, uh, we're also getting a, a grant every year that's reoccurring in order to run the facility. <clears throat> and plus, on top of that, the ladies that live there will, will have to pay rent. Um, it, is an, it is an apartment, so they will have to pay rent. So we're not going to be asking the county for a whole lot of money other than what we've asked for already. What is the expected overhead for the facility as far as staff, maintenance, utilities? Uh, you know, how will that be paid for? Um, just as mentioned before, we're, we're getting reoccurring funding. We're getting $154,000 every year to be able to pay the bills of the facility. And we, we will have a, uh, a lady living at the facility that is also the facility manager. So she will be able to live there as well as get some a paycheck as well. So we'll be paying for her to live there. And then, of course, maintenance, utilities. I, you can't put a price on that, you know, when, when you don't when you don't know. I mean, I, I could probably go back and find out what the what the bills were to you know, as as the motel. But our ladies are going to be there every day. So it'll be hard to to say what you know how much everything is going to cost. But but we are going to get that reoccurring $154,000 and then plus the rent that they'll be paying. So so we should be able to, you know, keep that facility running. All right. And do you expect any reoccurring grants for this facility other than what you had just specified? Um, not that I know of. We're always, you know, as a nonprofit and as a coalition, we always look for grant funding. Um, so if something else comes available, there may be a grant that that will be available, but I don't know about it. I don't know yet. I'm not sure that it will be available, but that particular grant pays for um, some of the, the resources and some of the things that we'll be doing inside of the facility. For example, uh, if we have uh, recovery meetings going on at our facility, this particular organization grant, and it's still from the state, will uh, reimburse us for what the recovery facility or the recovery meetings would. They have their own rate of pay or their own rate of reimbursement that they do for each each program that comes in. They have a reimbursement rate for each one of them. So, if we are uh, eligible for that, then we'll apply for it, and that will help keep the facility going. How will the policies be decided on for running this facility? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, simply, I don't know. Um, because we're not now running a, a housing facility, um, I don't have any policies in place yet. I've gotten several emails with other facilities, policies and procedures that they're, you know, uh, things that they're already doing. They're already running recovery housing, so they have their policy and procedures in place. The, um, I've got one from Butterfly Moments in Clarksville. I'm actually going next Tuesday to Crossbridge in, in Nashville to see how they run their, their facilities there. Um, uh, we do have some partners you know, in, in the coalition that have worked in recovery housing, so that will help as well. But as far as policy and procedures for our particular facility, I can't tell you what they are um, until I sit down with you know, the different individuals and find out what is gonna work for our facility. Because not, just like anything else, not, not everybody else's policy and procedures is gonna work for our facility. So we'll look at what pretty much most people do and then we will uh, we'll figure out our own that, like I say, that'll work for what, for what we're planning. All right, and if you don't have any policies and procedures, do you know any of the basics? Like, um, do you know yet if drug testing will be required regularly for the housing? Everybody that I've talked to that runs a housing facility that has anything to do with rehab or treatment, they do drug testing. Now, whether they do it on a, like, monthly, you know, weekly or whatever, I'm not sure how those work, and I, I'm not sure how they'll work in ours yet either. Um, will we do them? Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do drug testing um, because people relapse. And, you know, we want to, first of all, not allow for drug use to happen in our facility. But if they do relapse, we want to help. We want to get them the help that they need. And um, Stewart County Re uh, Rehab Ministries 
has actually, uh, we've talked to her, talked talk to them, and they will help us. If somebody needs to go back to treatment, um, they'll help fund that. How do you envision it all running uh, as far as the kinds of programs available on the site and rules, regulations, like what, what do you, what's your vision? We are um, partnering with several organizations that will bring their services to our facility. And the reason for that is, you know, we may have some ladies there who don't have their driver's license because of the charges that they've had in the past. Um, I know people in this community that still don't have their driver's license and they've been in recovery for about six years. Um, so we're going to bring as many programs to our facility as we can. We have um, life skills, GED classes, um, of course recovery meetings, uh, cooking classes. Those, the people that run those programs have already committed to helping and most of them gave me a letter of support before I wrote the grant. Cool. And I know you already touched on this before, but how many rooms will be available and will all of them accommodate children? Um, the state doesn't look at rooms, even though we're going to have separate rooms, they look at beds. Um, when I wrote the grant, I had to tell the state how many beds I was, I was going to have available. So in our facility, we're going to have 14 or excuse me, 15 beds. Now there are, um, if, if you know about how the motel looks, you know, there's a middle section and then they, they, it kind of goes off to the side. Each of the sides have has eight rooms. So that's 16. But what we plan to do is the very last rooms in that motel, we're gonna knock out the wall between the last two rooms in each side and make that one big room. And then we'll also have a bed in the, in the main facility for the facility monitor, facility director. Um, yes, they'll all accommodate children. Uh, we want to make those two rooms on both sides a little bigger in case somebody comes with an older child, maybe a teenager. You know, we'd like to put them in there. Um, but um, yeah, they, the, you can bring it. If, if you have children, you'll be, you'll be allowed to bring them. But we will have, you know, 15 beds available. How long will these people be permitted to stay in the room at the facility? Uh, the grant requires for us to allow them to stay until they until they don't want to stay there anymore. Um, part of living in a recovery community is the support that you get from the others that are in recovery. So they may decide that they want to stay there forever, and, and that's okay. Uh, we would hope that um, you know they get on their feet and they're doing really well, and maybe they want to buy their own place, or maybe they want to rent a bigger place. Because in you know the fact is it's going to be uh, it, it's going to be one room you know that they stay in the um, you know the rooms will be accommodating as far as you know sleeping and they'll have TVs and they'll have you know whatever they need in that room they'll also have a mini a mini fridge and a microwave the meals will be a family style meal you know everybody will get together that is the only meal that our facility will provide. So we'll have dinner for the ladies, but breakfast and lunch and snacks are gonna be on them. So they will have their own uh, refrigerators. Really, we kind of hope that, you know, um, as ladies get more uh, confident in their recovery, that they don't need the, as much support. They'll, they'll always be welcome to come back for our recovery meetings if they want to, but you know, they may want to venture out on their own and find their own, their own living space, whether it's a, an, a new apartment, whether they get to the point where they can buy their own homes or, or anything like that. So, but in reality, they're welcome to stay as long as they want to. What kind of security will there be on site to ensure the safety of the families in the facility as well as the safety of our community? So one of the things for sure that we'll have is closed circuit television or CCTV. I don't know. I don't know how you say all that stuff, but we'll have cameras um, in the uh, community areas outside the building, in the in the front of the building and the back of the building. If you've ever been there, then you know it. It kind of just goes off into. Uh, but um, we will have them in the front and in the back. Of course, we're not going to put them in anybody's rooms or you know anything like that but it'll be in all the community areas we're also planning on having um, it be gated 
also um, a gate to become into the facility where you'll need a four digit pin to, to open the gate and then one when you leave the facility that opens by itself similar to um, you know Fort Donaldson when you leave Fort Donaldson if the gate is closed and you kind of just pull up then then that'll be there um, also uh, you know Danny Peppers had kind of asked me about ladies who might live there that don't you know that maybe they have a domestic violence situation or whatever we're not going to post people you know what I mean we're not gonna put it out in there be like oh you know so and so lives here if they want to remain anonymous they can um, and we want to make sure that that people understand that that's you know that's how it's gonna be out there and as far as safety to the community I don't I don't see any issue as far as being some kind of threat to our community although we do have a good relationship with our law enforcement so we will have law enforcement you know just checking the facility out and doing their drive-bys with it being on a main road i don't see any issues with safety other you know as long as we have those cameras and things going on so and if a woman can't pay her monthly rent for the facility then what will be the consequences of that um, I don't like to. I don't like it to say consequences, but um, one of the things when we wrote the grant was if they can't pay, we can't make them. Um, there may be some some kind of health issue, you know, if they can't work. You know, when they do come to us, we're going to help them find work. We're going to help them find what they need to be successful in the community. If they, you know, perhaps lose a job or if they're not able to pay rent, then we'll expect for them to um, volunteer with some organizations. There's plenty of organizations in our community that can use volunteers. We'll also have them do work around, just around the facility, whether it's, you know, um, yard work or if they'll, you know, they may be the cook for the entire time while they're not working and not able to pay rent. but. It's not going to be, uh, we're not allowing for like a freeloader situation. If they can't pay their rent, they're going to have to work outside or, or volunteer outside the facility. And if a resident breaks the rules, then what will the protocols be for eviction? Uh, again, that's one of the things that I can't really say for sure what we're going to do uh, until I go in and, and see what, what others are doing. Um, I know there are some that you know they don't kick anybody out there are some that you know maybe it's a three strikes and you're out type thing so until i sit down with other facilities that are doing this same kind of thing i can't really answer that question you know for certain okay will residents have to sign contracts how will that be enforced yeah, I think that once we do have our policy and procedures in place, you know, they'll they'll have to look at it. It's kind of like a rental contract. Um, I, I'm not going to say, you know, it'll be exactly like that, but they will know our policy and procedures. They'll have a copy of them um, and they'll have to sign off that they're going to follow follow the rules, just like just like you would in a rental agreement, you know, whether it's a house or an apartment. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll definitely have that. And as far as it being enforced, you know, again, the enforcement is still kind of up in the air. Okay, and if there's one thing that you'd like to communicate to the people of the county regarding this project, what would it be? One of the things that we uh, have at the state level and all of the colleagues that are in recovery is the saying that we do recover. Um, and if you ask anybody who's in recovery right now, They'll, they'll tell you that recovery is possible. Um, the problem is, is that so many people that relapse over and over and over is that they don't have the support that they need within the community. And that's why a recovery housing facility is so important because once you get out of a situation, you need to have the help and, and the support to stay in recovery. Um, there are several people in our community that are in recovery and you wouldn't know it unless you ask them. Um, there are many business owners in our community that are in recovery. Uh, we have, um, like I said, with when I wrote this grant, one of the first things that, that it, we had to have was letters of support. And one of the letters of support that we had was uh, from, from Senator Bill Powers and he has recovery experience. There are others in the, you know, within our community that wrote those same letters that admitted to being in recovery and planning on helping us, 
you know, support these ladies in recovery, whether it was bringing in services, whether it was um, donating services, whether it was donating items, but the people that are in recovery can tell you what it's like to be in the in-between stages where they're not using drugs and not using drugs is maybe still part of recovery, but being reco in recovery is, you know, um, not using drugs and being very successful and having the, having the support that you need. And that's what this facility is for. It's not, um, it's not going to be uh, a, rec a revolving door. And I think that that sometimes is a lot of concern for people in a community that have places like, you know, places like this, is that it's just gonna be a revolving door, that it's gonna bring more drugs. Um, and that's just simply not the case. Um, people, people that are in recovery are not using drugs. And, and if they do relapse, we've already got a plan in place with the Stewart County Rehab Fund that will help them get back into treatment. And when I teach children about addiction and how hard it is to try to, you know, to stop using drugs and alcohol, I always tell them that sometimes it just takes practice. And um, if they have family members that are using drugs and alcohol and they've tried to stop and they've, you know, gone back to it, I, I always tell the children that sometimes it just takes practice. So I'm hoping that these ladies will, you know, be in good practice and that they will uh, thrive in our facility and that our community will continue to support them and support the coalition in its, you know, in our endeavor and trying to, you know, help other people. Because again, you know, in the beginning of this interview, that's what my passion is, is to help people. And whether it's people that are addicted to drugs, whether it's people that have mental illness, you know, um, when I first started this job, I, I was the resource. Um, this coalition was the resource and now we've grown and we have many more resources in our community we've got therapists in our community we've got you know 12-step uh, programs in our community so i feel i feel blessed that you know we're growing and becoming more recovery friendly but it's still you know we still got a little ways to go but again like i say one of the things that i, I want people to know is that we're we're in it for the long haul it's not going to be a revolving door. It's not bringing more drugs into our community. That's not that's not the plan at all. So um, that's just that's just what I, I I'd like for people to to know. And um, again, with this facility, if if you're interested in doing any kind of donation, again, like I say, we don't really know what we need until we get in there. But you are welcome to go to our Facebook page and sign up for our email list. And then once we decide and, and, and understand what we do need, then we can email that out and, and get people, you know, interested in, in donating the things that we need.